I'm Millie Dinsdale from ProWritingAid. I'm joined here today by Julie Broad, author of Self Publish and Succeed. Julie's here to explain why self publishing might be the better choice, as well as five top tips to set yourself up for success. So, welcome, Julie. We're so glad to have you here with us. Thanks so much. I'm just going to bring up my slides here and definitely put questions in there. I love questions. Uh, and so, and Millie, if there's something that's pertinent to what I'm talking about, you know, feel free to just interrupt and I'll answer the question. Otherwise, if it's not directly related, we can just answer them all at the end. Uh, so yeah, so today's topic, bye-bye book deals. And for many folks, I know there's book deal dreams. And, and I had them too. I definitely had book deal dreams myself. And as a little girl, I actually thought I would become a writer, but then somebody told me writers don't make money. So I ended up going to business school and then doing an MBA in real estate and finance and getting started real estate investing in 2001. So my book deal dreams kind of took a great big detour, but through real estate, I actually, uh, I started writing a newsletter in 2006 and uh, and then I, I ended up quitting my job and going full-time in real estate and starting a real estate training and education company. And through that, I ended up getting introduced to a couple of publishers. And so suddenly that little girl who thought she could be a writer, she was back and she was so excited. And I had book ideas, of course, as many of us do. And so when these publishers started talking to me, I told them about my book idea. But both of the publishers said, no, you know, it was, they felt like it was a general real estate book and that it had already been done. But Wiley said, but you know, we're interested in working with you and we have a book idea we've been looking for an author to write. And so Wiley, you know, one of the major publishing houses was saying, hey, here's a book idea. Let's build a proposal together. They weren't saying, go get an agent. They were, you know, they were working with me. And so we built uh, this proposal over going back and forth for three months. You know, I hired people to review the proposal, sent it to them. They gave me feedback, went back and forth. And so at the end of this three months, I was not even thinking that it wasn't going to be a book deal. It was more like, I wonder what the terms are going to be. I wonder what they're going to offer me. Uh, but I ended up getting an email from them saying the marketing department doesn't feel you have a strong enough platform to sell books. So first they didn't like my idea. And now they were telling me that I could not sell enough books to make it worth their while. So it was devastating. Again, that little girl's hopes and dreams were crushed. Uh, but I, after I recovered, I realized that it was the greatest gift I ever could have been given um, for a couple of reasons, which we'll kind of elaborate on as we go through today. But ultimately it kind of forced me to go into self-publishing because that original book idea that I had was nagging me. And I knew I, at the time I had read probably 70 real estate books on the market. I'm one of those people who does deep dives into something when I get into it. And, and I knew my book idea was good and I knew it was needed and I knew it was not something that was on the market already. And most importantly, I know, and I knew that it would help other investors that were setting out on a path that I had set out at that time, about 11 years prior. So I decided to self-publish and I dove into it with a bit of a vengeance. I was thinking, well, if, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it better than if Wiley had given me a book deal. Now, this was 2011 when all of this happened, and there wasn't a ton of information on self-publishing out in the market yet. There was one book called Author, Publisher, Entrepreneur. So I, I read that book, and then I just collected whatever information I could, and I went into this. And I ended up uh, writing the book idea that I originally wanted to write and self-publishing it. And I took that book to number one on Amazon as a print book. So I was in Canada at the time. I now live in Las Vegas. <clears throat> But uh, this was number one in, on Amazon.ca as a print book, and it stayed in the top 100 print books for 45 days, something that Wiley, we're pretty sure, has never done with a real estate book. <laughs> so a niche nonfiction self-published book at number one, selling thousands and thousands of print books. Uh, it was pretty, pretty epic, and I made so much more money than if I had gotten a traditional deal, and, and it was so much more uh, just it just felt so good to write the book that I knew needed to be written and take it to number one. Uh, head of Dan Brown, that was kind of cool. Head of Game of Thrones series, also kind of cool. So the benefits of self-publishing, I didn't know. Again, I thought I had to have a book deal to be a real author. Kind of that was my mindset at the time. But 
after I realized I made eight times on every book sold. So again, if I had gotten a traditional book deal and sold the same amount of books as I sold to kind of have that breakout year that I had, I would have made less than $10,000 on book royalties because you would, I would have made less than a dollar per book sold. I, whereas selling on my own, I made $86,000 through selling through the different channels. Plus I did a lot of live events where I sold books at the back of the room for cash. So I made oh, so much more money. Um, I also had full control over my book content. Remember Wiley didn't want to publish the book idea that I ended up publishing, which was more than cash flow. They wanted me to write some other book, which looking back, I actually would be a little embarrassed to have written that book because it was not a book I was excited about, really felt was needed, or that I felt like a true, true expert in, but they were going to give me a book deal. So I was going to write that book. But in this regard, I had full control over that content. I had speed to publish. Uh, a lot of people don't realize how long traditional publishing takes. Most of the time, especially in nonfiction, but even in fiction, you have to go get an agent and then you have to write your book proposal and then they shop it around and then you might get a contract, but it takes months to contract. Most people are two to four years away from publishing if they're going the traditional route, depending on where they are in the process. Whereas if you self-publish, I mean, you could self-publish really fast, but to, to self-publish at the same quality as a traditionally published book, you know, you're probably six to 12 months away from launching that book. Uh, it's so much faster. But here's one that I did not realize entirely. And when you self-publish, you own your intellectual property. And the best example I can illustrate or I can give to illustrate this is a friend of mine who actually did get a book deal with Wiley around the same time as I was rejected. Uh, he, a few years later, left the real estate space and got into more of the um, self-help and personal development space, space. And I was still at the time buying books, buying pretty much every real estate book that went on the market. And I bought the latest book on investing in US real estate. Uh, I was again in Canada. So this was a book for Canadians and I bought it and I started reading it and I was a couple pages in and I'm like, I've read this book before. And I look at the cover and I'm like, nope, don't know that author. I look at the copyright page. Nope. It just came out. How could I have read this before? That's so weird. I keep reading it and I get to this story, which I knew for a fact was my friend's story. And it suddenly dawned on me that this was his book, but it wasn't his name on the cover. And I flipped through it and I pulled out off the shelf. I got his book off the shelf and I went side by side and they were word for word, the exact same book, except for the introduction. And I called him and I said, like, I'm sure you know about this, but what happened? And he said, look, it's, it's morally gross, but it's legally okay. I mean, Wiley owns every single word in that book. Wiley owns it. All my stories, all my expertise, all my steps, all my tips. They belong to Wiley. They don't belong to me. And when I stopped promoting it, they decided to publish it under somebody else's name who would public promote it. So your property, that intellectual property that you've worked so hard and you put in that book, it does not belong to you anymore. You don't have the rights to license it in other countries. You don't have the, the rights to license it into television shows or movie shows or movie shows into movies. Uh, you also don't have audiobook rights in many cases, depending on the contract. And the uh, publisher may or may not pursue those things, but you won't have the right to do that. Um, I also had conversations with production companies about show concepts. Nothing came to fruition, but I had another colleague who did end up getting a deal uh, with a production company. But in order to negotiate, he had to buy his book back from Wiley, which involved buying every print copy that was in circulation, which, you know, when you get a traditional deal, one of the main advantages still to this day is widespread bookstore distribution, but you can still get bookstore distribution self-published, by the way. Uh, my books are on bookshelves, uh, physical and online, uh, but uh, Wiley would not negotiate with this production company that wanted to do this show for HGTV. And so my friend had to buy back all the books, all the books, <laughs> and you don't buy them back at print, you buy them back at retail. And, uh, and then they shot the pilot down in Florida and then HGTV didn't end up green lighting it, but he doesn't regret buying back the rights to his book, but it was a big, another eye-opening experience for me. Um, and ultimately this is the big point that a lot of people who think they need a book deal don't realize readers don't care. If you invest in creating a high quality book and producing it at the same quality as a traditionally published book. The readers don't, they're not worried about that. All they care about is, is this a great story? Is there a great outcome in this for me? Do I learn something that I didn't know before? 
and nobody's searching for the latest Wiley or Penguin or, <laughs> or whatever publication. They don't search for the latest book published by those companies. They search for problems. They search for authors they've heard about. They search for book titles they've heard about. So now the thing that comes up often when I've told this story about being a number one bestseller, uh, first of all, I, I'm still waiting to dance with Ellen, which is probably <laughs> a dream that's gone now and same with Oprah I always thought Oprah might call because I was you know this indie author that took my book to number one none of that happened many many other great things happened like I ended up eventually transitioning from real estate to running book launchers which is a professional self-publishing services team and truly the greatest thing I've ever done in my life I work with amazing people both my team as well as the authors that we work with so it was a very indirect route to get to exactly where that little girl who always wanted to be a writer was meant to be. But being a bestseller on Amazon is something that the self-publishing world has taken a bit of advantage of. And there's companies that will charge you $5,000 or whatever to be a bestseller on Amazon. And I want you to kind of forget <laughs> about this goal for the most part. I want you to focus on writing a great book that's clearly targeted, and I'll talk about all those things in the tips today. Uh, but focusing on being a bestseller can make you do things that aren't beneficial to the long-term success of your book. And this was just, it's, a, it's an example from a handful of years ago, but I still love it, so I share it. Uh, anyone can be a bestseller on Amazon. And this book, at the time, if you look it up now, it's got content in it, but at the time, it was pretty much a blank book. And he just took a picture of his foot, <laughs> <laughs> and put it on Amazon and got a handful of people to buy a copy of the book. And he hit Amazon bestseller status. So he's got his little orange flag, which is what people want with the total of three copies sold. And he wrote an article for the observer, basically saying, what does it take to be an Amazon bestselling author? So I share that one because it's kind of funny, but because a lot of people post about their bestsellers and, you know, being behind the scenes, I can tell you that a lot of people who get this flag have sold less than 20 books. So it's really not that big of a deal. Um, when, you sell, when you hit something like number one or even top 100 on Amazon, you're selling thousands. Um, but when you're number one in a category and it's often some sub, sub, sub category. So it's often like, you know, books and then business and then, you know, uh, women in business and then women in business who wear pink. <laughs> That's like a sub, sub, sub category. I, I made that one up, I hope. I don't, I really hope there isn't that category on Amazon. Um, number one bestseller is, is often kind of gamed in that regard because it's updated hourly. So all you really need to do is have a coordinated sales effort of a very small number uh, to hit that category. But the bigger problem is if you game the system, and so this, if you take a look at these books, so hopefully you're familiar with the Amazon also bought or customers who also bought, as you can see here. So this is the Amazon algorithm at work trying to show your book to people who will buy it. And they do that based on people who buy books like yours or buy books, you know, they might buy this book and then they buy this book. And so they use that information to potentially promote your book, which is what you want. You want that behemoth of a, of a beast to be showing your book to people so that it sells. Now, when you look at these books, what book do you think this is showing up under? So typically you're going to see very similar type books because it's going to be books that this per that, you know, that people bought. Um, when you see this, you're seeing, you know, feel good naked, the magical business method, um, kind of a law of attraction, a relationship book, you know, getting over chemo, uh, really, you know, another relationship book. So I'm sure it would shock you to find out that this was a real estate book. Uh, and there's no other real estate books underneath. And I can guarantee you somebody who's buying real estate books is buying personal finance, other real estate books, maybe um, other kind of investing books. And there's nothing like that here. So what happened? He joined one of these groups that said, you know, uh, we'll make you a bestseller. And all the authors get together. They drop their book down to 99 cents and they all buy each other's book at the same time. Uh, and so you have 30 to 50 people who would never normally buy your book, buying your book, and you get that Amazon bestseller flag, you get that dopamine hit when you post it on social media and everybody tells, tell you, tells you how awesome you are. And then a year later, because that's when I took this screenshot, a year later, you're wondering why my book is not selling at all on Amazon, and this is why. Amazon has no idea who the ideal customer for this book is because damage was permanently done by playing with the algorithm just to get that bestseller flag. 
this is what my book looks like. This is my latest book over here, um, Self Publish and Succeed. And no games were played in the selling of this book. And what do you see here? You see Successful Self-Publishing by Joanna Penn, 14 Steps to Self-Publish a Book. Start writing your book today, the nonfiction book. The only book here that is not about writing or publishing a book is More Than Cash Flow, which makes sense because that's my first book. And I can guarantee, I can tell you with certainty that the best way to sell old books that haven't been selling is to write a new book. Um, even though this book was on self-publishing, my book on real estate investing and my book on personal branding both got a nice sales lift when this book came out earlier this year. So this is what customers who also viewed this item should look like. That is a healthy, healthy uh, algorithm at work because everything makes sense that people would be buying this book and then want to see my book or vice versa. All right. So now you're sold on self-publishing, what are you gonna do to set yourself up for success? Well, one of the reasons I started Book Launchers is because I was running into a lot of folks, A, that had traditional deals that actually weren't selling a lot of books or they were unhappy with various things in the process, but I also was running into a lot of self-published authors who were having trouble selling their book. And there's a couple things that happen that create challenges for authors. And one of the big things is when they set out on the, the whole, I'm going to write a book thing. There's one of two things that they're focused on that really mess them up. One is bestseller. And part of the reason that that messes you up is because if you're pursuing a publisher or you're working with a publisher, you're now really focused on the expectations of the publisher. You're thinking about the money, you're thinking about the media attention, and you're also probably thinking about your friends and family and how they're going to admire you and think it's so cool that you wrote a book. Um, some of these things are conscious, others are unconscious, but no matter what, when you do this, the thing that you've done is you've put yourself in the center here. You've put yourself as the best-selling author and all of the things, and you've made yourself the product. And when you make yourself the product, your ego gets in that driver's seat and ruins everything. Uh, I've seen some really good books get ruined by egos because they get people's opinions that aren't the ideal reader and they, they influence the title or the cover or something else. Um, people also get afraid and they don't put in the very story that would have made their book a breakout hit. When you are focused on yourself, you won't be thinking about the very thing that will actually make your book your, a success, which is the reader. So the number one tip I can give you today is when you write this book, and I'm almost entirely talking about nonfiction because I don't have a lot of experience with fiction, but I believe that this is still the case when you think of fiction, uh, you wanna be thinking about your reader. Now, specific to nonfiction, what's the outcome for the reader? What are the stories you have to tell, not because they're good stories, but because the reader needs to hear those stories in order to achieve the outcome that you know that they need to have at the end of reading this book. And then you have to deliver all the material that they need to achieve that outcome. When you put the reader at the center, you now make decisions that are marketing focused consciously and unconsciously, because you're not thinking about whether this is going to make you look good. You're thinking about, okay, what does my reader need from this book? And how am I going to get that to them? In what capacity? Is it going to be steps? Is it going to be tips? Is it going to be stories? Is it going to be case studies? And it changes the entire focus of your book if you do this. All right. Tip two. This is one of the biggest mistakes that I see self-publishing authors do is they write their book and then they figure out how to market their book. The problem with this is that if you, if you remember my story, the whole reason Wiley turned me down was they assessed the marketing of the book before we wrote the book and they decided I couldn't sell enough books. Now they were wrong, <laughs> but they, the traditional model is one that is very marketing focused. They are not giving you a book deal unless they can see a path to selling, you know, five, 10,000 copies at a minimum. So if they can't see that clear path, they're not going to give you a book deal and you're not going to be writing that book. Self-published authors really need to take a page out of that. Now, <clears throat> a lot of self-published authors don't have that clear path to 5,000 or 10,000 uh, book sales. So they're not going to get a traditional book deal, uh, which is fine, but you still have to think like a traditional book author would in that you need to come up with that marketing plan and write a book that is marketing focused. And you have to do all of that hard thinking before you start writing. 
this is the number one reason. Um, so book launchers has been in business for just about just a little over four years now. And in the early days, we would take people at any point in the process and help them. But we consistently struggled to work with people who had already written and edited their book on the marketing side, because my team pitches for live appearances and speaking gigs and, and um, media and podcasts and newsletter articles and anywhere we can find your readers hanging out. I mean, we, we're even getting people into schools because that's a great place to sell books. So we do all of that kind of work for our authors. But when people were coming to us late in the process, we were struggling to get them wins. And what we realized was that very few, very few authors have done this work early on. So their book is just not set up and ready for marketing. So you got to think, who are you writing for? What's the outcome you want for them? And how do you uniquely help them get that? You're not the first book on this subject. I can guarantee it. <laughs> and if you are, I'd be a little nervous. I'd be wanting to do a whole lot of market research if you're the, the first book on whatever topic it is. So you have to figure out what are you doing that's slightly different than that reader and how are you getting them to a very specific outcome. One mistake a lot of people make, especially if they're writing memoirs, is they think their book is going to be inspiring. And that's a mistake because there's so many other books out there that are by famous people that already have the marketing juice behind them because they're famous that are inspiring. If you aren't a known name, your book needs to inspire them to a very specific outcome. And you've got to get very clear on that. So are you inspiring them to stop eating sugar so they can lose weight and be healthier? Are you, stop, are you inspiring them to, uh, you know, to learn more about something that they've never heard of before, but that will get them to a specific outcome, better relationships, more popular? <laughs> you got to think about that and really, really focus on that. And you're not getting too specific. Go, go niche. Go as niche as you possibly can because you'll find it so much easier to market. I want to give you an example of a hook. So this is Michael Brenner. He wrote the book, Mean People Suck. When he brought it to us, it was called The Empathy Formula. And it was a really cool book, lots of really good information. Uh, we can all use more empathy in our lives. Uh, but the challenge is empathy is a tough thing to sell. Okay, so going back to that marketing thing, he'd written it and he'd had some colleagues read it. And one of them told him to just bin it. They're just like, you got to start over. This is, nobody's going to buy this. We read it and started talking to him. And what we needed to figure out was what does empathy give you? And what's something that he's uniquely positioned to kind of angle in on empathy? And through those conversations, uh, you know, our team discovered, we have somebody on our team called the story expert. And the story expert's job is to figure out the hook and what makes somebody cool and how we're gonna deliver that to a specific reader. And they were talking and Michael's had 42 different jobs and he kind of just blurted out, you know, a lot of people think you have to be mean to get results from people, but, you know, mean people actually suck. And that's when this was born. And it, you know, the empathy formula just was rebranded into mean people suck, how empathy leads to bigger profits and a better life. And that is a hook that has juice. And it, you know, you can see he was on TV. He had a lot of exposure. Um, a lot of his consulting kind of angled around this, this subject. And and it's still the empathy formula. It's just all in how the hook was positioned. <clears throat> and this can set apart your business too. So here's another example, the marijuana haters guide to making a billion dollars from hemp, uh, the next disruptive industry. So this is, you know, the, the title actually really says the hook. Uh, he is somebody who was very anti-marijuana, uh, but he ended up discovering the investment, the business possibilities of hemp and traveled around the world, met with farmers who were farming hemp and many businesses. And he really uh, has just become the expert in this, in, that, in this as an investment class. And it's really positioned him and his business. And this book is doing incredibly well right now. Uh, and he's been very busy, busy, so he hasn't even been promoting it. So a lot of it is just based on the strength of the hook and the power of the keywords too. <clears throat> So tip three, I've, I've really hit this one, but I wanted to make it, it its own tip because you need to know who your reader is. Your reader is not a demographic. So anybody who's thinking, oh, my, my reader's all women or my reader is everybody that's over 40 or, you know, millennials, that's not your reader. And your reader is definitely not everyone. Nobody, nobody has a reader that is everyone. I mean, think about it. Even the Bible, which is probably the most widely read and purchased book out there, uh, its reader is not everyone, right? So your reader is not everyone. What problem is your reader trying to solve? Where are they already looking for solutions? 
And how are you going to help them get there that they're not getting there somewhere else? So a lot of people say, well, how did you get your book to number one? And it really came down to knowing exactly who my reader was. My reader was somebody who was either thinking about investing in real estate and they were nervous about the things that could go wrong, or they'd already bought a few properties and things were going wrong and they didn't understand why. And that was my, that was my reader. It was very specific because the, the hook and what made my book very different at the time, um, it ended up coming out in 2013, by the way. Um, but what made my book different was that I was talking about all the things that had gone wrong for us. We had a property manager charged with manslaughter. He punched a tenant in an altercation and the tenant later died in hospital. Um, he ended up turning our couple of our properties. We had a sixplex and an eightplex that he managed. He turned one of them into a known crack house. Uh, and we had to plead guilty to fire code violations with that. I had a, in a different city, I had a, I had a property manager robbing rent money from us. Uh, we had tenant pull knife on another tenant, like the list of things that went really wrong, nearly destroyed my relationship with my boyfriend at the time, who's now my husband, we made it through. Uh, but it, you know, we ended up breaking up and moving and moving out. We were living together at the time. Um, the real estate drama was so intense in our lives. But you don't read, you weren't reading about that anywhere. All you read about was, oh, here's how, figure the numbers, find the market, you know, basically get rich in real estate following my plan. Uh, and my book really talked about, hey, listen, if you make this decision, this is some of the outcomes you can expect. And mortgage brokers, realtors, real estate clubs, there was a real estate magazine in Canada. They loved this. They absolutely loved it because I was solving a very specific problem that a lot of people had that was not getting addressed in the market. But my marketing plan was also that very same thing where I'm going, okay, where's my reader trying to solve their problem right now? It's all these places. And guess what this is? This is my marketing plan. This is why my book went to number one is because all these places supported my book when it launched. And a lot of people are afraid of going specific and going niche. And yet it's, I've seen it over and over and over again, that it's a tremendously powerful way to sell a whole lot of books. Um, Lorea Martinez, her book, Teaching with the Heart and Mind, this is for educators. That's not a huge market. And it's not even for all educators. You know, it's for ones that are interested in connecting with their students to make a difference. Uh, her book has done incredibly well. This is a really specific one. Uh, Pat Watson wrote a book on tactical lock picking. Uh, this is for first responders. And uh, in the fire space in particular, we found a tremendous uh, I think his book, when we were pitching, we normally have a 20 to 35, sometimes 40% success rate. So if we pitch you for 10 places, we'll get two to four wins, just as an example. With his, I think we had a 70% success rate on his pitches for podcasts, for webinars. He even got some paid stuff right out of the gate uh, because it's such a specific niche focused thing uh, that as soon as the, the, fire, the fire training groups and the firehouses and places like that saw this book, they were like, yes, yes, we want to do something to promote that book. Uh, so when you go niche, you will find your marketing is so much easier because people can immediately go, yes, they don't have to think about it. They don't have to compare you to four other people who might offer something similar because you are the one. All right, this is a cool one. You ready for this? This is one that everybody always consistently tells me. Nobody's ever told me that before. Um, and again, this is for nonfiction, but I believe that if you do this for fiction, you'll stand out too. Develop a unique table of contents. This isn't your writing plan. This is after your book is going through editing, go back through and make every chapter either create curiosity or offer a benefit or sell some sort of a value. And when you do this, the marketing of your book will be so much easier because here's the thing. Um, I see way too many books that have the chapter finding your why. So if you have made that uh, error, <laughs> um, you have the opportunity now to change it. Um, also conclusion, conclusion is the most boring thing in the whole wide world. Can't you set them off with a call to action, something inspiring. And remember that the people reading this table of contents are potential readers. So they like your cover, they like your title, they flip it open if they're in the physical space or they click on the look inside and they go to your table of contents. They wanna see chapter titles they have not, they feel like they have not read before. So again, people have already read a book or two or 10 in this category. They're reading your book, looking for that one good thing that they haven't read somewhere else. So can you create curiosity as to what you offer or sell a benefit? And when you do this, you might find yourself getting workshops, media attention and speaking gigs as a result because 
We've seen this, I've seen this. My second book has a chapter title called You Are Who Google Says You Are. Uh, largely, that's the only reason I sold any volume of my second book, which was called The New Brand You, uh, is because of that chapter, because people wanted me to do workshops on that subject and they would buy copies of my book for everybody in the room. Um, but media and speaking uh, event bookers, they're looking at your table of contents and they're either booking you or not booking you based on the value that they are seeing or guessing is in your book based on your table of contents. So it's worth brainstorming and spending a lot of time on each chapter title. And finally, of course, your title and subtitle. There's so much we could say about this, uh, but I just really wanted to highlight a couple of things because one of the things a lot of people do is they fall in love with the title and there's 10 other books that have the same title. So now you've set yourself up to compete with a whole bunch of other people and they haven't done keyword research before they create their subtitle. We do keyword research for uh, Google as well as for Amazon before we brainstorm any title subtitle combinations. Uh, titles are our best if they're short. Uh, you want them to be memorable. You want them to be easy to say. The new brand you, which is my second book, is not easy to say. I know this because I've done a lot of podcast interviews and speaking engagements and everybody, even when they're reading the title in front of them, says the brand new you. So if I would have done some testing before that, I, before I put that book out, I would have realized that nobody can get it right. So test it. Tell somebody your title and then see what they say it is about 30 minutes later and see if they get it right. And if you're consistently hearing people say it wrong, it's not them, it's your title. So <laughs> that's a little tip for you. Um, it speaks to your reader. So you really have to, it doesn't matter if you love your title, is it something that's gonna make your ideal reader go, oh my goodness, that book is for me. Um, and Google it to make sure nobody has the websites or that it's like dominated already. And of course, uh, check to make sure it's not trademarked because you can have the same title as another book, but you can't have it if it's trademarked. So I put a couple examples up here. We've got this one by Jeff Link. Uh, it's called Protecting the Pig. I love a good alliteration. It's also easy to remember, easy to say, easy to spell. Um, and then his subtitle really tells you who it's for. How And it has keywords, stock market trends and grow and preserve and wealth were keywords for this one. So how stock market trends reveal the way to grow and preserve your wealth. And then we have this one, uh, which I want to give you guys a totally different topic, uh, true crime, killers keep secrets. Uh, so again, we've got that killers keep uh, secrets. And this one, the only keyword we really had to get in there was the Golden State Killer, because this is a true crime story about the brother-in-law of the, tr of the Golden State Killer, who was also roommates with this guy. Um, and, and of course, being the brother-in-law, his sister was married to him. Uh, he, with this book, we didn't want it to have Golden State Killer in the title because it's not about the Golden State Killer. It is about the brother-in-law and how he didn't know. He had no idea that his family member, his roommate, his friend was the Golden State Killer. And so that's the story, but we really had to make sure we got the Golden State Killer in it because that is the juicy keyword. Uh, and then one more, another alliteration for you, the profit problem. Uh, and they say, I make money, so why don't I have any? It creates curiosity. It alludes to the fact that it's going to explain why you feel like you don't have any and teach you how to uncover the money that you have. So if you want tips to write a book that will sell, uh, especially if you're looking for a business book guidance, booklaunchers.com forward slash business book is a download that I have for all of you. Uh, and even if you're, again, this isn't great for fiction, but in nonfiction space, if you are writing a book uh, and you want to position it with a lot of the things we talked about today, so you've thought through the marketing, this guide will help you with all of that. And ultimately, you know, no matter what kind of book you're writing, I think great books change lives. And I want you to think about who you're going to impact and keep that reader in mind the entire time. Because when you do that, you'll be setting yourself and your book up for so much more success, whether you traditionally publish or self-publish, but ultimately I'm a pretty big fan of self-publishing after everything I've been through. So um, that's all for my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have now. Thank you so much, Julie, that was brilliant. So we have a couple of questions that have been coming through as you've been talking. So if we just go to the first one, which is um, a question about editing. So the person has asked, how do you deal with editing? Do you have to hire an editor? 
um, proofreader and kind of what's the cost out of pocket for that? Yeah, for sure. So, uh, so editing is, is, I think, mandatory. All, you know, even if you're using software like ProWritingAid, I think it is, ProWritingAid does a tremendous job of guiding you, helping you create a better draft, um, taking a look at things for those, those final little errors that may have snuck in. But at the end of the day, there really is no replacing the human editor. And so I believe that every book needs three different kinds of editing. And the first kind is a developmental edit. And the developmental edit is that 30,000 foot view of your book. They're looking for structure. They're looking at the story elements, your credibility. Um, is it, who is this for? What's the book about? You know, it gets down to the, the fundamentals of what makes a great book. Uh, what I've seen a lot of is people who don't know that they need developmental editing first and they go out and they hire a copy editor. Copy editors are tremendously costly. They're, they're, the, you know, they're a very expensive professional in the whole book. Uh, they're the most expensive professional, I should say, in the whole book process. And, uh, but what you find is if you haven't hired a developmental editor first and you go to copy edit, your book will be grammatically correct, but it won't be good or it won't be as good as you hope. And that's because a copy editor follows rules. They're, they're going to do your sentence structure, your word choice, your punctuation and your grammar, but they're not taking that, that higher look at your book. Uh, so that's kind of the, the orders that developmental editor or content editor, it's also called a copy editor and then a proofread. And the proofread uh, you know, is the, the cheapest part of the process. Um, and I, you can do it when your book is still in a manuscript format, or I recommend you doing the proofread once your book is in layout so that they can catch you know, any little things along the way. The price varies. So it really depends because some editors will price it based on the quality of manuscript and how much work they're going to have to do on it. Uh, and then some will charge per word. Copy editors typically charge per word um, and developmental editors may charge per hour um, or still per word, but only after they've assessed the manuscript. The best thing you can do is go to sites like Readsy and see a chart of kind of the range of quality uh, professional experience and the types of books, because that's also going to vary uh, what kind of book you're writing, what kind of editing you'll charge. But most of the nonfiction books that we work on, the editing costs, and most of the word counts, like somewhere between 45000 and 70000 you're going to be spending somewhere between 2000 and 4000 on all of the editing. Brilliant. Um, so we've actually had a couple of questions come through about marketing. So um, how do you market a book? How, how do you manage Amazon? How do you manage Facebook? Um, kind of what was the process that you went through for that? Yeah, so for me, I, don't, I didn't use social media at all. Um, I'm not, it's not that I'm not on social media, but social media doesn't sell a ton of books. And all you have to do is look at the, the numbers to figure that out. Because if you look at how many, if you go to your insights on Facebook or any other post, and let's say you have a thousand friends or followers or whatever the metric is there, uh, look at how many people actually click on a post right? It's, it's, I mean, how many actually see it of the thousand is small, and then the number that click on it. And so if you can think, well, of those, of those 20 people that clicked on it, maybe one bought your book from that post. So social media is has value. There's especially in the marketing side, when you're doing podcast interviews and live events, um, being able to share it somewhere is important and having an audience is important. But for actually selling books, I've never spent a ton of time on social media. Where the tremendous value of selling or where the tremendous process of selling books comes in is really leveraging your network, making new connections. And so depending, we have a, we have a four launch strategy menu that we will use for our clients. And a lot of people think the strategy menu is going to be, okay, this is the kind of launch I want, right? Like I want the wall street journal bestseller, or I want the Amazon bestseller. Uh, that's not how it works. How it works is we look at your resources that you have. What kind of a platform have you already built? So do you have a newsletter list? Do you have any social media? Are you speaking already? Uh, and if you have none of those things, then you are the only real launch option for you is to go into what we call the phased momentum launch. And that phased momentum launch, the early days, which are when your book is done, but it's not available for sale yet. So it's in pre-launch you're going to be pursuing reviews. So you're going to rally a book army of supporters to, you know, to read your book and then be ready to write reviews early on. You're going to be pitched for media. We do media training. 
we get your speakers one sheet ready, we get your media kit ready, we pitch you for podcasts, we start pitching you for uh, live appearances, we plan your book launch party if it's going to be at a physical location or a virtual location. So all those things are happening in pre-launch. And then every month after your book comes out, we're trying to build your audience and build momentum and sell books. And so you build momentum over time. And if you have no audience and a very limited network, that's really your only launch option. Um, other companies will charge you all kinds of money to tell you you're going to get some other kind of launch. But the reality is the guaranteed way to sell books is through your network or through your own audience. Yeah, so we've just got a couple more questions. Um, so this one's focusing on actually selling the book. Um, on the difference between Kindle and book, do you think that you need to offer both options or um, is it, are you able to choose one? Uh, between Kindle and what? Um, Kindle and physical books. Oh, physical books. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, that's great. So in the fiction space, uh, ebooks sell a lot stronger than in the nonfiction space. I still think you need both. And in fact, I would also add audiobooks to that as well, because audiobooks is one of the fastest growing, uh, it is the fastest growing uh, product in books. But uh, if you can't afford the investment that an audiobook requires, you, you really should do a physical as well as a print. I also don't focus only on Amazon. Uh, and there's two reasons for that. One is that I think uh, Amazon has a tremendous amount of power. And if we all start publishing exclusive with Amazon, we're just giving, you know, it's like you're just feeding that monster and making it bigger and stronger and it can do whatever it wants to you. Um, the other part of that is that you're not reaching libraries. Uh, you're not reaching uh, other places where your readers are hanging out. So I always recommend you go wide with your print at least, and you can go exclusive with your ebook on Amazon if you want, you make a lot more money, but I like to just go wide with ebooks as well as with print books and be available everywhere books are sold. So actually following on from one of your previous answers, um, someone's asked about a book launch, um, what's involved and how do you go about planning one? Yeah, uh, so this is also where I highly recommend, um, I have a YouTube channel, booklaunchers.tv, and there's an entire playlist dedicated to launching a book. And I only say that because it's an enormous amount of things. And <laughs> I highly recommend you watch the you know, pre-launch and the launch day and the post 30 days and 90 days videos, because it'll teach you a lot more. Pre-launch, uh, you really want to focus on reviews. If there's only one thing you do is line up as many reviews as you possibly can. Um, and my rule of thumb is for every five people that say they're going to write a review for you, you can expect one review. So that tells you how many people you need to rally to get yeses from. Um, if you get more, that's a bonus. That's great. Um, but, you know, close friends and family actually can't write Amazon reviews for you. So you have to reach that outer network. Um, so that's number one. Um, in your pre-launch, you're also lining up your event, um, looking for supporters, contacting influencers, getting endorsements for your book. Uh, there's a whole bunch of things that you can do. But if there's only one thing you do, and that's get Amazon reviews, you're going to be set up for a lot more success in launch and post-launch because you've got that social proof. Your Amazon ads will perform better. Anybody you pitch that looks at your book, they'll go, oh, great. They've got 20 reviews that give it, you know, almost five stars. So that is the number one thing. Yeah. Um, again, following on from um, what you said earlier on, um, someone's asked about the trademark issue with the title. Is it? Um, relevant if you change the subtitle or is the trademark just for the string of words? Um, I, I think I understand the question. So it, the trademark, so some titles are trademarked, like for example, Freakonomics, right? Malcolm Gladwell's books, he trademarks all the titles. You can't use Freakonomics. That word can't be used anywhere. Uh, it doesn't matter. But the title itself, like um, I'm trying to think of another title example, um, like Will It Fly? I don't think by, by Pat Flynn. I don't think that's a trademark title. It might be. Um, but you could use, if it's not trademarked, you could use Will It Fly anywhere. You could use it as your title, your subtitle. I just wouldn't, right? I don't want to compete with somebody else who has a successful book. And if I can't get the URL and I can't be, you know, top two or three on Amazon and Google when somebody searches for that, I don't, I don't personally recommend it. Yeah. Um, so we're just going to have one final question which is um, how do you get reviews before your book's been published? Um, uh, something against Amazon policy, if you have reviews that aren't by verified purchases. So how do you get around that? 
Um, yeah, so first of all, you anybody who already has spent $50 on Amazon, they can write a review. So it doesn't have to be a verified purchase. Uh, the verified purchase, I believe, is better for your like the people looking at it and deciding whether to buy it. But on the summary at the beginning of your book page, it doesn't say it, how many verified reviews are there. It just says 53 ratings. Um, so that part's fine. And they don't have to be verified reviews. They don't have to have purchased it. Uh, they just have to have spent $50 on Amazon. We use a few different tools to get early reviews. So we use something called Book Sirens to get a secure, to send around a secure ebook copy. Um, I also tend to get my, to get the verified reviews. I get my book army. I set my ebook to 99 cents on Amazon. I get my book army to buy it for 99 cents. And then I send them through Book Sirens, the e version of the book. Uh, so that they can read it before it's available. Uh, and then as soon as the uh, Amazon is available for reviews, which is usually on your launch day, they can post the review and it shows up as a verified review because they bought it for 99 cents. So that's typically how we do it for verified reviews. Um, but there's also a couple other tools which tools or programs out there. So we also use NetGalley. NetGalley is more expensive, but it gets you reviews from professional book reviewers. They tend to post it on their blogs. They often will post it on Amazon as well as they sometimes will end up listing their book in their library or their bookstore after reading the book. Uh, and then we also use Goodreads giveaways. Goodreads giveaways um, doesn't result in a ton of Amazon reviews, but you get your book listed on a whole bunch of readers' shelves and it does usually generate Goodreads Goodreads uh, reviews. And then sometimes some of those reviewers will also post on Amazon. So I know I said that that was the last question, but we just had one more come through um, about how important is it to create an online presence before publishing or is it okay to do that after? Yeah, I mean, it depends. It takes a long time to build an online presence. So if you don't have one right now, I would use your book when it comes out to build your online presence. But just knowing like mentally, this is the piece why I said, uh, it comes back to if you think you're going to have a huge launch, but you have no following and no audience, you have to reset your expectations and realize your book is going to be the tool that you're using to grow that audience. Right. Well, thank you so much for speaking to us all today. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, feel, feel free to join some of our upcoming webinars. And if you have any questions that haven't been answered, please just drop us an email at ProWritingAid. And um, have a good evening, everyone, or a good afternoon if you're in America.